cellular structure, cell shapes. And if you look at this figure right here, you can see that you have squamous cells, which are going to be flat cells, cuboidal cells, columnar cells. So let's say that you're going to find in the brain, for example. You scroll down. Next concept that we need to understand is that the cells have different sizes. Organs have different sizes, so it makes sense to have cells with different sizes as well. So you need to understand the cells have different shapes as well as different sizes. Basic components of each cell. We can look at that in this figure where you have the cell right here. And what is composed of, then you're going to have the algae complex. You're going to have mitochondria right here. You're going to have microtubules, which are these lines. A smooth and rough plasmid reticulum, a rough and the plasmid reticulum, centrioles, nucleus. Okay, the next item is cell surface. Here we have the main topic, which is going to be the plasma membrane. So let's take a look at drawing of the plasma membrane. You can see it right there. The green one in here are going to be carbohydrates. The purple are going to be proteins. The golden in here are going to be phospholipids. And the blue ones are going to be cholesterol. And some of the functions of these membrane proteins, as you can see right here, they're going to be receptors, enzymes, channels, cell identity markers, and they also function as second messenger systems. Keep scrolling down. The glycocalyx is a substance that is going to cover the cell membrane like an icing on a cake. Right, the cake would be the cell, the icing would be the glycocalyx. The glycocalyx is basically carbohydrates with lipids and carbohydrates with proteins. They are very important because they are going to be unique to each individual. For example, my cells are different than your cells because my glycocalyx is different than your glycocalyx. Okay, now extensions of the cell membrane, of microvilli, they are located in your intestines and they increase the area of absorption for nutrients that you have at the level of the intestine. Other extensions that we're going to find are going to be cilia. They are not extensions like the ones before. In this case, these extensions look like hairs, and you're going to find them, for example, in your trachea to eliminate mucus that we have in the trachea. Another extension from the cell membrane is going to be flagella. Flagella, in this case, is located in specialized cells such as the spermatozoids. The spermatozoids are going to use the flagella for movement as well, but this is going to be for propulsion. Another one that we're going to find, it's not permanent, but it happens from time to time, they're going to be the pseudopods. The cell more or less goes up to here, up to this level. But you see in here the cell produces or creates these extensions that are going to elongate from the main area of the cell outside in order to collect, for example, this substance that you see right there. So the next topic is membrane transport. What's the job of the cell membrane? Obviously, is to provide boundaries to the cell, but not only that, but also to allow cell transportation, meaning to allow things to go inside the cell and things to go outside the cell. How these processes are going to happen? Well, there are two main types of cell transportation. One of them is going to be active, and the other one is going to be passive. Passive doesn't use energy. Active uses energy in the form of ATP. What is it that passive is going to use then? If it doesn't use energy, it's going to use differences in pressure or concentration. So when you have differences in pressure, for example, from high to low, if you have two areas, let's say outside the cell and inside the cell, outside the cell is five, inside the cell is three, then the things are gonna move from the outside to the inside because it goes from high to low. Examples of passive transportation are gonna be filtration. That's how things get filtered. So you can see this figure from the outside to the inside or from the inside to the outside, depending where you have more. Again, remember, it always moves from high to low. Now you have diffusion, same thing. It moves things from high concentration to low concentration, as you can see right here, high concentration to low concentration. In this case is solutes, okay? You're gonna find right here, some of the factors that are going to affect diffusion. For example, molecules move faster when it's hot, so temperature affects diffusion, molecular weight. If you have oranges and an atom, then the atom will move faster through the cell membrane because it's smaller. So the size and the weight is going to be important in cell transportation. Okay, Membrane surface area. If the cell membrane is two inches and you have another one that is two feet, then obviously in the one that is two feet is going to be much easier for cell transportation to happen because you have more area. Membrane permeability. If you have a membrane made of bricks, nothing will go through. 
But if you have a membrane that is made of tissue paper, then a lot of things will go through because it's permeable. So obviously membrane permeability will allow things to move from one side to another. Osmosis is the passage of water from high to low. Inside our body, we are not made of just pure water, right? We have solute inside. So then you cannot say that this is going to move from high to low because of the amount of water, because you also have other molecules. Because of that, you need to consider the total amount of forces that water is going to give you and the total amount of forces that these other molecules are going to give you. But remember, you cannot think about just high water and low water. You have to think about all the forces that you have, not just water, but also the other solids, such as, for example, glucose and salt. How do you measure, for example, this glucose and this salt? You measure that in concentration. And that means osmolarity. Okay, what is osmolarity? The concentration of the solute, especially those that are not going to move from one side to the other, non-permeating particles. Now, what is tonicity? In this case, tonicity is the ability of a solution to affect the fluid volume and pressure of the cells. What it says is that if you have the same amount of solutes inside and outside the cell, then nothing is going to happen. For example, this is the red blood cell, and this is outside the cell, but you have three pounds of salt. So since you have three pounds outside and three pounds inside, then nothing is going to happen to the water because it's not going to move. Therefore, this type of solution outside the cell is going to be called isotonic. If you look at this other case right here, this is a hypertonic solution using the same example. This is going to have inside three pounds of salt. Outside, you're going to have five pounds of salt. Because of that, the water will go from inside the cell to outside the cell. And that's why the cell will shrivel. In hypotonic, you have in the cell three pounds of salt. And outside, you're going to have, let's say, one pound of salt. You have more salt in here. Therefore, the water will go from the outside to the inside. And therefore, the cell will swell and eventually may explode. 